hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2016 New York City water rate. My name is Eric Landau and I'll serve as the hearing officer for tonight's meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to just take a minute to give a brief overview of how the evening's process will go. Um, I'd first like to note that we place certain documents into the official record, including the notice designating me as the hearing officer, a copy of the public notice listing this hearing, and an affidavit of publication of such notice. The draft of the proposed water and wastewater sewer rate schedule, the public information booklet regarding the water and wastewater rates, a copy of which is available just outside these doors uh, by the registration table, and also written statements submitted to the water board. These items are marked exhibits one through five in the record. After I introduce the members of the New York City Water Board, we will hear a presentation from New York City Department of Environmental Protection Commissioner Emily Lloyd on the water rate proposal, and then we will open up the meeting uh, to the floor in order to hear from you, the members of the public. I would also like to acknowledge and introduce Nancy Seinflohn, DEP's Deputy Commissioner for Customer Service. Nancy. Nancy and other DEP staff are on hand this evening to answer any specific questions you may have about your account. If you have not yet signed up to speak uh, and would like to, please take time either now or during the presentation or just after the presentation to do so. There are sign-up sheets just outside uh, at the front table where you walked in. Uh, please know that you can also submit written testimony to the New York City Water Board from today up until the close of business uh, this Friday, May 1st. These statements will be entered into the record and copies will be distributed to the Water Board members prior to their adoption of a rate schedule for fiscal year 2016. It's my pleasure to introduce the individuals joining me up here. Uh, Alfonso Carney, the Chairman of the New York City Water Board. Water Board members Tawan Davis, Joseph Finnerty, Adam Freed, Jonathan Golden, um, and New York City Water Board Executive Director Stephen Lotz and Treasurer Mateel McLean. Mr. Chairman, do you have anything to add before we begin? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Thanks, Eric. I don't talk as fast as Eric, so it'll take me a few extra minutes to say what I want to say. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, you now know who I am and what I do. It, it was my great honor last month to succeed uh, Alan Moss. Alan was, was chair of the Water Board for a number of years, as some of you may know, um, and uh, his leadership uh, inspired several of us who served with him on the board. Uh, it was it is my great honor to succeed Alan. Um, what I really want to do is to thank you for coming. Uh, it's a Tuesday night. Uh, there are a lot of other places you could be and a lot of other things you could be doing. Uh, we have something that we think is important to say, and so we're going to say it, uh, but, but we're glad you took the time to come out here uh, to both hear us and then to let us hear from you, and, and, and that's essential. It's important that you understand that we're here to listen uh, as much as we are here to talk. Uh, this is a public hearing, and by its very nature, that means that we are here to hear from the public. So thank you for being here. You all know that uh, New York City has an incredible water system and wastewater system. Uh, each of us, all of us, who serve as members of the board, serve because we want to ensure that the system is protected, operated, and improved in a manner that is both effective and efficient. We know that we appreciate the fact that the job is a big one. Uh, we undertake it willingly. Uh, we want to be here. We want to do this job. We want to do it as well as we can. We need your help to do that. Uh, a big part of that job, of course, is to listen. You know, we do these public hearings, and you all come out to tell us how you feel about what we're doing, uh, and we do listen. Uh, we will respond to questions, or at least the commissioner, and uh, Stephen, will, uh, the first deputy commissioner, will respond to your questions tonight. Don't hesitate to ask or, or comment. That, that's what we're doing. Um, the commissioner is going to take the microphone in a minute and deliver her presentation. Uh, and it's your turn, and I mean that very sincerely. It's your turn. Step up. Ask questions, make comments, let us know what you think. For your information, uh, this is the second of five public hearings we will hold this week. The first was last night uh, at Staten Island. Uh, we're in Brooklyn uh, tonight. We'll be in the Bronx and Queens uh, the following two nights, and then Friday afternoon, we're in Manhattan. Uh, thank you again. I, I say it over and over. Thank you for being here. I'm uh, grateful, grateful to have you here. Good, good to see you. Uh, speak up and we're finished. Commissioner Lowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? No. There we go. 
How's that? Okay, good. Getting a thumbs up in the back. Thank you. Um, so tonight we want to essentially give you an overview of what we have presented to the Water Board um, in telling them the rate that we think will be needed to cover the costs of operating the water and wastewater system in fiscal year 16. Um, so this is a composite of, of uh, various information we've given him, them. It pretty much follows uh, the same outline, although we uh, keep tinkering with it, trying to make it a little more, a little less uh, geeky and a little more user friendly for people who don't look at it um, every day. Um, but we'll walk through and then, um, as the chairman said, we'll have a chance to hear your comments. So the rate that we are proposing uh, this year is a 3.24% increase um, on the existing water rate. Um, while we wish and always wish um, that there was no rate increase, and we'll walk through uh, why we're recommending this one, um, we are relieved that it is the lowest rate um, in the past 10 years, and it would, uh, it would equate to a, a, a an increase of about $33 a year uh, for an average single family home um, and somewhere between $21 and $31 um, a year for a typical unit in a multifamily uh, dwelling. Um, in, in any discussion of what the water rate um, is going to be or that we're going to recommend, um, we have to start with what the rate pays for. Um, so a quick overview of the water and wastewater systems. Uh, water supply uh, is a, a vast uh, system of reservoirs upstate. Uh, we deliver about 1.1 billion gallons a day to over 9 million customers. Uh, those are the residents of New York City and about a million customers upstate. Uh, we oversee the protection of about 2,000 square miles of watershed. We regulate uh, sewer use, development, a variety of things uh, to minimize any impacts on the reservoirs. And we maintain dams, aqueducts, shafts, 7,000 miles of water mains, 110,000 fire hydrants, um, just to give you some sense of the scope of it. On the wastewater treatment side, uh, which is an increasingly complex operation, we treat about 1.2 billion gallons of wastewater each day. We operate 14 wastewater treatment plants, 96 pumping stations, 7,400 miles of sewers. You'll possibly be familiar with one or more of the treatment plants uh, in Brooklyn, Newtown Creek, Owl's Head, Coney Island, Ward Island, or Red Hook. Um, you, may, uh, you may be familiar with, or happily you may not be familiar with. Um, we also manage stormwater. Uh, everything that falls from the sky. Uh, a lot of it goes into catch basins and into uh, the sewer system. Much of Brooklyn, most of Brooklyn is a combined sewer system, which means uh, domestic and, uh, and businesses, what they put into the sewer system gets mixed with the stormwater. Um, we also have some separated sewers. We have some areas that are not very well sewered with stormwater uh, sewers yet. Uh, but increasingly, we're using green infrastructure, and you may start seeing uh, various kinds, such as bioswales, I'll show you a picture in a minute, uh, to manage uh, the kind of rainfall um, that is increasing um, over the next few years, we anticipate. We have 148,000 catch basins, uh, which we inspect and clean if needed every three years. Um, storm sewers, four major combined sewer overflow tanks, um, and an expanding system of blue belts, which are a, a large form of green infrastructure. So what drives the costs that go into the water main? Um, first of all, aging infrastructure, where much of our system is very old, both on the water and the wastewater side. The Croton system east of Hudson was built in the 1840s. Um, the oldest water mains go back 150 years in some cases. I get notices whenever there's a water main break and it seems very frequently. It's 1878, 1889. Uh, I always get the year of, of the water main. Um, and the sewer system generally was built out at the same time. Uh, water tunnel number one, which serves uh, the Bronx and Manhattan and a small part of Brooklyn, uh, was built in 1917 and has been in continuous service since. 
um, without any break for, uh, without taking any kind of a rest or vacation, uh, or are being able to inspect it for that matter. Um, we also have incompletely built out systems. Uh, people in South Brooklyn, Southeast Queens, Staten Island are certainly familiar with the fact that there are big swaths of New York City that have no storm sewers, uh, which is increasingly a problem. But there are all the, also other parts of the water infrastructure that are not built out um, adequately, we think, and I'll talk th about that a little bit more in a minute. A big driver for us are mandates, and I'll talk about those more, but they're basically the things we have to do to come into compliance with two landmark pieces of legislation that were passed in the early 1970s, the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act. And then the fourth thing increasingly is dealing with climate change. Um, and that's everything from hardening our wastewater treatment plants, which by definition are adjacent to the water and, and uh, low to the water, um, to looking to resizing our sewer system uh, or supplementing it in ways because it's built essentially for average rainfall, not for the kind of concentrated cloudburst that we're seeing with climate change. So just to touch on investing in aging infrastructure, just to mention a few of the projects, some of them you may be familiar with from press coverage over the past few years. City Water Tunnel 3, which is being built to allow us to finally shut down water tunnel number one to inspect and repair it, uh, has been under construction since 1973. Uh, the Bronx and Manhattan portions are now complete and in service. The Queens and Brooklyn parts of it, which then connect to Staten Island, uh, are largely built out, but the shafts are not complete yet, so they are not quite ready to come online. Another big project for us um, that has to do with age is the Delaware Aqueduct. It was built in the 50s. We know, we have known for decades that there were leaks up there, significant leaks. Um, and finally, and we've been very concerned about the risk associated with that, that we might have some kind of failure. The Delaware Aqueduct carries about 50% of our water on a daily basis. Um, so we are in the process of building a bypass tunnel to go around the leaking part of the aqueduct, which will then be mothballed. Um, and that will be built over the next uh, about eight years before it goes into service. We also have a very significant dam strengthening program upstate. Um, it seems to me whenever I hear uh, something on the radio or watch on television about aging infrastructure, they say bridges and dams, and they talk about that because they're so high risk. Uh, potholes are one thing, they pose certain risks too, but a bridge that falls down or a dam uh, that collapses pose tremendous uh, threat to people around them or using them. Um, so we are investing in our dams. Uh, we are completing a major upgrade of Gilboa Dam. Uh, upstairs and upstate in Schoharie County, uh, and then we will in the next 10 years start strengthening the dams on the Ashokan Reservoir. And finally, we have a very aggressive program of high priority accelerated water main replacement program to start going at, at, over those old water mains. About two thirds of the water mains in the city are cast iron water mains, which we no longer use. Uh, they're very durable. Uh, they go back to the original water mains from the uh, 1870s. Um, but when they fail, they tend to fail catastrophically. Um, and so the ones that we, it's not always a matter of age. Uh, we stopped using them about 50 years ago. Um, but the ones that we are going in and replacing are ones where we have started to see leaks and that sort of thing. And we think because of the wear and tear, traffic volume, whatever, um, that probably they are, should be on a high priority list for replacement. System completion. Um, some of the big pieces of that are uh, the Kensico Eastview Connection Tunnel. Um, when we uh, bring the water from west of Hudson, 90% of the water, we to bring it all to Kensico uh, Reservoir in Westchester County, and it comes from there to the city. One of the recent things we've built is a UV treatment plant to treat bacteria, to kill bacteria uh, that, can be, that can be deadly. Um, and when we did that, one of the two tunnels, we always like to have two tunnels because if one, something happens to one, we want the other, bringing 90% of the water to the city. Uh, one of those two tunnels cannot function with the new UV plant. Um, so we are now going to rebuild that uh, second tunnel. Another big part of our, of our plan for the next 10 years is, and, and for the past 10 years has been building out uh, the missing sewers and of course using blue belts to substitute for sewers in some cases or supplement them. To talk a little bit about the big mandates uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, 
Um, just to, to make sure you know what that is, the Safe Drinking Water Act sets national health-based drinking water standards for public water systems. And in particular, it requires us to protect against two bacteria, Cryptosporidium and Giardia, both of which can be deadly. And you may recall across the country in the past 30 or 40 years, there have been uh, deadly outbreaks of these bacteria in drinking water systems. Some of the big projects we've done around that are the Croton filtration plant. The water from east of Hudson, which is typically about 10% of our water, has to be filtered uh, because there's too much development up there to keep it unfiltered. Um, and that plant will be coming online uh, actually in May. Uh, the filtration avoidance program west of Hudson, we hope to keep the water unfiltered, and that's a very aggressive program that allows us not to filter the water, but we've had to do things like upgrade over 100 upstate wastewater treatment programs, upgraded over 4,000 septic systems upstate, um, and 7,000, put in place 7,000 farm pro projects uh, to keep farming activities from contaminating the water. You may remember, I think it was Toledo that had to shut down their water system because of uh, algae growth in one of the Great Lakes. This is the kind of thing we're trying to prevent upstate. On the, safe, on the Clean Water Act, uh, which was passed in 1972, sets quite aggressively and ambitiously uh, the national goal that water quality uh, will be suitable for the propagation of fish, shellfish, wildlife, and provide for recreation in and on the water. That is increasingly interpreted to mean that every, this covers waters of the United States, which is somewhat controversial, um, but that increasingly means that every body of water has to be swimmable. It has to be safe enough for you to dive in and go for a swim. Uh, with New York City's many tributaries that by and large no longer have a freshwater feed. They are not flushed by uh, the tides going in and out and they've been heavily used for industrial uses for uh, over a hundred years. That is a very big hill for us to climb. Uh, so over the past 20 years, um, we've had an aggressive program to reduce combined sewer overflows into these waters. Uh, we've built four CSO facilities, big tanks to hold combined sewer overflows until there's room at the plant again and they can be pumped through there and treated. Um, probably the big plant, the biggest plant expansion that we've done is Newtown Creek. You may be familiar with it. It's the big silver eggs you see if you're on the Long Island Expressway. Uh, someone said to me, oh, I thought that was a nuclear power plant. It's not, it's Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plant. Um, we also are required to do a tremendous amount of nitrogen removal. One of the byproducts of sewage treatment is a lot of nitrogen. And again, if that goes into the surrounding waters, it causes algae growth and, and is detrimental to uh, aquatic life. And that's a very expensive program we're putting in place. And then looking to the future, you will be familiar with some of our other long-term control plans for CSOs, which include uh, the Gowanus Canal, which is a super fun site where we have both EPA and uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation to, uh, to satisfy in terms of what we do there, uh, a program for Coney Island and one for Newtown Creek. So sometimes when I talk to people about this, they say, Really, you're spending all that money um, just to clean up the waters, to get a little nitrogen out of it? You know, why is New York City responsible for doing that? Well, legally, we're responsible. Um, and in fact, it has had a very substantial effect. What you will read about every day is the tributaries that still have some pollution. But in fact, if you look at this map, you'll see that over the past 30 years, all those things that were red and yellow prior were not suitable for recreational use, even for boating, much less um, swimming. And what you see now in blue and green is essentially safe for recreational use. The blue is safe for swimming. Um, and there are just a few small areas uh, that still need aggressive uh, treatment. So we have made some progress. I just want to mention briefly, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, you'll be relieved to hear, um, but there are also operating costs associated. Every drop of water from the time it leaves the sky and enters our reservoirs until it enters the surrounding, or leaves the sky and enters our catch basins and enters the surrounding waters is highly, highly regulated. One of the things we're required to do is test 
um, the water, both the drinking water and the water going into uh, the harbor uh, and the tributaries many, many times along the way. So we have an extensive system of labs five drinking water labs, four harbor quality labs, and we do over a million analyses every year that we then report to DEC and the State Department of Health and the City Department of Health on. Going back to the capital expenditures, um, which is, you'll see, uh, there's, a, there's a reason why it preoccupies it, and that's because it becomes so much of a driver in the water rate. Uh, between 1985 and 2014, we have spent almost $40 billion on capital projects. Um, and if you look at the chart, the blue and green, uh, the dark blue and green to the right show the mandated projects. So almost half of all that uh, $40 billion has been mandated uh, projects. And I would say about the mandated projects, some of people who, who come, who talk to us frequently, um, advocates for envi uh, quicker environmental compliance um, say, how can you try to drag your feet and go slowly on reducing CSOs into the waterways? And I think the, the answer is um, we very much embrace the goal. Uh, we very much worry about the amount and pace of the expenditures that are required to get there. Um, so over the past 30 years, half of our capital program has been mandated. Nothing that we don't think is a good thing to do, but we might, in some cases, have argued, we did in some cases, argue unsuccessfully to slow the pace. If we can take hold questions to the end, please. Um, and so uh, the reason we do this is because if we don't come into compliance, uh, the penalties would be enormous. Uh, typically, a project where we're in non-compliance will cost us somewhere between 10 and $14 million a year in penalties, and in some cases, as with the Croton filtration plant, after a certain amount of time when our regulators are really irritated with us. For example, if we don't open Croton on May 17th, there is a non-negotiable $65 million penalty uh, we will have to pay. So it's, uh, it's very motivating to uh, make these investments and get it done. I talked about, these are, these are our national mandates, and um, I think that it's always for us interesting to look and see what other cities are doing. And what other cities do are doing is exactly what we're doing, which is coming into compliance. Uh, the, all these lines show the 30 largest cities. The bright lines are the ones that we sort of consider most like New York City for a variety of ways. Um, and over the past 30 years, you'll see just about everybody sort of dragged their feet on compliance until about 15 years ago. And then the regulators, whether it was EPA or their state regulator, started really forcing them to come into compliance more quickly and everybody uh, started to make those big capital expenditures and their water rates um, started going up accordingly. So at the rate of increase, we're just about uh, in the middle. We're a little bit above the national average of the 30 largest cities in the rate of increase. Um, and then if you look at the Next one, we are, in terms of our water rate, but the average uh, rate payer pays, um, we are just below the national average. So in both cases, we're sort of in the middle of the pack. We always hope that people know that we take the obligation to contain our costs uh, very seriously. And we think one of the ways we can show that is reflected in the fact that of all the typical monthly costs that a New Yorker pays between housing and electricity and gas and cable service, if they have it, and heating oil, um, we, this is the only cost that is actually below the national average. Um, so we are, we are working very hard uh, to do things in a way um, that is as cost effective as possible for New York City. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't show you that slide. That's us on the far right. Um, we also, when we do these hearings every year, we want to use it as a chance to also report on some of our service efforts. Um, there's been, and I, not having been at the EP over the past five years, I say this without pride of authorship, but the staff has done, I think, a very good job at improving the quality of our service. Uh, for example, this year, catch basin complaints were answered 21% faster. The average time to repair or replace a hydrant, a very high priority, is improved by 22%. Uh, 
Uh, we've had 37 fewer complaints about leaks on private infrastructure. We think that's because of the service line protection program that I'll mention more about in just a minute. And we've also put in place uh, a program called Operations Excellence, uh, looking at, at best practices around the world. Um, we have made some reductions in our chemical um, costs. We've achieved energy savings for a recurring uh, $45 million reduction in our operating costs. Um, that uh, has, has, we think, uh, been very helpful, and we are still uh, continuing that process looking for more. <clears throat> looking to the future, what are some of the big investments that we feel we need to make over the next 10 years? Uh, we have a capital budget that's about $15 billion, um, and it is, again, really uh, balanced between mandates and some of the uh, other categories I mentioned to you. But one of the things that's happening is that as we catch up on some of the big mandates, we are able to play catch up on some of the things that are not mandated, um, which is a great relief to us. And that includes some of the things I've mentioned, like the Delaware Aqueduct Bypass, um, some of the energy, uh, invet, uh, energy efficiency investments to come into compliance with the city's goal of an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050, um, and a lot of uh, dam work and a lot of water and sewer um, uh, replacement and, uh, and expansion. Just to mention a couple of Brooklyn projects, um, I mentioned the Gowanus, the, the combined sewer overflow controls that uh, we will be required to put into place. We've estimated a cost and that's in the budget. We have a lot of sewers and water mains, over a billion dollars worth um, in Brooklyn over the next 10 years, a lot of green infrastructure. Uh, we have the 26 award settling tanks, uh, which is to improve our, our treatment process. That's a mandated project. We have an unmandated project at Coney Island and that's to support um, a lot of development that's anticipated after rezoning a couple years ago out there, uh, including a lot of affordable housing, which is a very high uh, priority for this administration. Touching again on green infrastructure, I just wanted to come back around because um, we see that so much as a way to cost effectively expand our gray infrastructure. Uh, we will be constructing 7,000 bioswales. Um, that's a bioswale in the picture to the lower left. They look like um, like uh, tree pits on steroids. Um, they are constructed to absorb water. There's a cut in the curb edge so that water from the gutter flows in there before it gets into the sewer system. And then they have engineered soil so that they detain or retain the water. And they're planted with plants that soak up a lot of water. Uh, we will be building, and the ones we've built over the past couple years are performing above what they were engineered to do. Um, so we are very pleased with these and think they're going to be a big help in managing stormwater in the future. We are also participating with the Parks Department uh, on their Community Parks Initiative. Every big park that they're doing as part of that is going to have stormwater management infrastructure underneath the park, which is the way, the direction we should be going in. Um, and we are also uh, working with School Construction Authority, with NYCHA, um, to make improvements on their properties as well uh, that will provide stormwater management. Um, and we have a program, you'll see on the lower right, uh, that's a before and after picture of a school in Brooklyn, PS 261. Um, I think Steve's children went there, um, or at least one of them did. And um, this is a program where we take a, an asphalt a uh, playground next to a school um, and we put in storm water management infrastructure underneath and then Trust for Public Land raises money to go in um, and do a, a, uh, a very green um, infrastructure above. And then we're also providing some grants for pilot projects to demonstrate ways that storm water management can be done more aggressively on private property. Okay, just a word on how all this capital investment turns into a water rate. Um, we, um, when we start a project, the first thing we do is the Office of Management and Budget. Basically, we go to them and we say, this is what we think it's going to cost us to operate the system, and these are the capital investments we think we need to make in the infrastructure. Um, and when, once they have certified um, our budget and approved it, um, then we convert that into what we think it's going to um, require us to borrow. And the first thing we do is when we start a project, we commit it. That means if we have a, an amount of money we're allowed to spend over the next 10 years, when we commit a project for, say, $50 million, 
OMB puts a hold on that money. We can't spend it on anything else, so we won't overspend our budget. Then when we actually start, the, then we have to hire, we have to design it, we have to hire somebody to build it, and then when we actually start spending the money on the project, um, if we start to borrow the money to pay for it, and then almost immediately that starts to turn into debt service at a rate is like your mortgage. You pay for it over the life of the project. Although, in fact, in most cases, we pay for them over 30 years and the projects last 50, last 50 or 100 years. Um, but it's roughly about $5 million for every $100 million of, uh, of capital investment. I know Mathiel is very uncomfortable with my using such a crude rule of thumb, but, um, but there you have it. Okay, looking ahead to the next year, I'm almost done. Um, again, look at that blue uh, on the left. That is the debt service. So you see why we think about it so much because it's such a big part of the budget. It's our largest single uh, part of our operating system costs. Um, and then come, after that comes the operations and maintenance um, and other smaller pieces. Um, looking at what's happening with the 2016 budget versus the 2015 budget, just to mention a couple of things, you'll see that our debt service is going to be up. We had a very good debt service year um, in 2015. Interest rates were very uh, low and we were able to borrow uh, lower than what we had projected. We are hopeful that next year the same will happen, but we, uh, we project conservatively to make sure we can cover our costs. Um, we also this year had a very aggressive program for buying back old debt. Um, either defeasing it, retiring it altogether, or trading it in for less expensive debt, um, which saved us a significant amount of money in debt service. But we spent um, $800 million on that. The coming year, we're only projecting uh, spending 350 because we think we actually bought back, we traded out a lot of the debt that was attractive to do. But if the opportunity presents itself to save us money in the long run, we, will, we may spend more but right now we're projecting to spend less on that. Operations and, operations and maintenance are projected to go about 8%. That includes, uh, you, uh, if you read the paper, I'm sure you know that we've uh, settled a lot of labor contracts that have been outstanding for many years. So this sh uh, reflects the cost of those labor settlements, which include back payments uh, for several years. It also includes bringing the Croton filtration plant online, a lot of energy, a lot of chemicals. Um, and things like that nitrogen removal program, which is a very expensive program that we are uh, under a mandate to continue expanding. Um, the rental payment this year, which is what we pay the city for using the infrastructure, is going up, but so is the return we're getting back on that. Um, to the, this year was a very low one because our debt service was so low. It's based on the debt service. Next year will be, will be higher, but we are also, uh, which I'll show you on the next page, uh, starting to get back an ever larger percent of the debt payment in future years. Um, and finally, the cash on hand at the end of the year. Um, we, as a good operating practice, keep about 15% of our operating costs on hand. Uh, that's in case there's some significant unanticipated drop in revenues. For example, that happened uh, in the crash in 08 when suddenly uh, we had a, a lot of revenues that uh, that dropped off, people couldn't pay their bills, and it took a uh, long time to work that out. Um, so we, we hedge against that, um, and we also keep money on hand. For example, I mentioned the Gilboa Dam. After Katrina, we realized that the Gilboa Dam, probably that we were probably uh, not anticipating a large, as large a storm as we should have it built for, and so we went in and made emergency repairs. We had to right away write checks for hundreds of millions of dollars. So we keep cash in hand. Sandy is another example when we had to go in right away and pay for fixing the wastewater treatment plants. Some of that money we'll get back from FEMA. Some of it we won't. Uh, but we don't tap the city budget. We don't tap uh, the general fund. We fund ourselves for everything. So we keep about 25% of our operating costs on hand against an emergency need. That money, in turn, gets rolled over to pay the cost of the next year. And the first thing we do with that money is pay our debt service, which makes the people who buy our bonds and the bond rating companies very happy and keeps our bond, um, our bond rates very low. So our total system cost, we anticipate for next year, will be $4,771,000,000. I know it sounds like a staggering sum. That is about even compared to last year. So why do we need a water rate increase? 
All right, again, just following those numbers to the next page, there's the 4787 and the 4771. Well, we take that number, this total system cost we project, and we take away from that what we're carrying over from the previous year that I just mentioned. So we have $906 million we can apply against that need, that operating cost need. Um, it's less than last year, so that's one thing. We have less to carry over this year. Um, we also um, have about the same upstate revenue. I mentioned we have upstate customers, um, and that is a, 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 an income for us that we can deduct from the cost of operating. And then I mentioned the rental payment. This year, the return we got on the rental payment uh, was $31 million. Next year, the city is committed to giving us $41 million back and more in the following years. Uh, so you'll see that on the last line. So if you look at the net revenue needs, 2015 compared to 2016, you'll see it goes from 3 million 582, I mean 3,5,82 to 3,6,4,0. Billion All right, so this year, the water rate that we had brought in the amount we needed to pay that operating cost for 2015, 3 billion 582. In the coming year, we expect continuing, we have very aggressive conservation programs uh, for a variety of reasons, including getting ready to shut down the Delaware Aqueduct when we do the switchover, when we will do without Delaware water for a period of time. That reduction in use will also bring with it inevitably a reduction in revenue, and there are other, other non-recurring revenues that we won't have. Um, so that, if we, if we had the same rate as 2015, that would only bring in $3,526,000,000 million um, next year. It would bring in less than it did this year. Our revenue need is slightly more than last year, $3,640,000,000. So the gap we have is $114 million, and that, in order to bring in that $114 million, we need a rate increase of 3.24. I just want to mention a couple of additional things um, before, we, before we end. Um, one is that um, we, have, um, we have had in place for several years now an automated meter reading system. One of the really positive things about the automated meter reading system, it was painful to put in place. One of the reasons is many of the old meters that we replaced in people's homes were very old and so they were running slow. When we put in a new meter, they act more accurately registered what people were using in the way of the water. So some people's bills were not, some people's bills actually went down. Um, but the good thing about it is that we and our customers can now track the water they're using every single day. We can tell them exactly what they've used. We don't have to have someone knock on their door and go in the basement to read the meter, resulting inevitably in estimated bills that can go on a very long time. So our estimated bills have reduced, been reduced by 81%. That means that customers are much better informed. And as a result, billing disputes have been reduced by 56% just over the past five years. Um, we also, because we are able to track this, um, have people enroll in a leak notification program. So as soon as we see a spike in their use, we can let them know that something's going wrong. They may not know it. It may be in their wall. They may have forgotten to turn off their water in the backyard, and the pipe may have burst. It can be a variety of things. We can let them know that something's wrong with their water use, and they can then get it fixed. And um, we, uh, we estimate um, that the people who have gotten leak notifications have saved, on average, about $831 uh, by fixing that leak before, um, before it costs them a lot of money. In addition, last year we expanded the leak forgiveness program to apply to more. It used to be it was only if it was something you couldn't see in your wall, but we expanded it to cover just the regular fixtures in your house as well. Um, and so typically people who have taken advantage of that um, have been able to save about $1,000 each. So again, these are programs that uh, are allowing people to manage their own water use to save themselves money. Uh, we also have about 177,000, 178,000 customers who have enrolled in the Service Line Protection Program. This is an insurance program, essentially. We selected the vendor competitively, and what it means is most people don't think about their service line. 
They last for 100 years sometimes. They last for 150 years sometimes. But when they fail, they are very expensive to replace. The service line is the property owner's responsibility from the water main or the sewer line into their property. Uh, it can be 15 or $20,000 to fix one. And so it um, is very important that people not have that kind of unexpected cost. And we, um, through this program, have enrolled 178,000 uh, people who are now protected. We have also been trying to think about how we can um, provide some uh, buffer for people who uh, have lower incomes in the city. Um, and last year we introduced something called the Home Water Assistance Program, um, HWAP. Um, and we started out uh, by extending to people automatically, they don't have to sign up. If they're signed up for the Heat Energy Assistance Program, Heat Program, which is a federal program, we automatically give them a rebate of 25% of the minimum charge, about $116, uh, $116 credit um, against their bill once a year. Um, in addition, we um, now are extending it to a much larger pool of people to include all the seniors and people with disability um, rebates from the Seven a day, which is Mateo or Steve? What is it a year? Seven. Four hundred sixty-four. Four hundred sixty-four dollars a year. Um, this basically covers the cost of service to the house. This covers again because it's about half of the cost of a typical bill. It covers the cost of the infrastructure being connected to the house. Um, and this has been frozen for three years now. And about twenty-six percent of the bills we issue to single-family homes are minimum bills. So again, it's a pretty a significant swath of people who are getting um, some protection from the increase in the water rate. I mentioned the service line protection program, um, and we are also offering a $10 credit as a small a modest incentive to get people to uh, do their billing online. Um, that allows us to communicate with them more effectively. It also saves us money in terms of sending out bills, I'm sure. Um, you, like, like uh, my family, gets, uh, gets contacted by everybody every day saying, please do everything you do with us online, and we are no exception. Um, all right, just again, to come back to the rate that we are recommending to the Water Board, um, it's a 3.24% uh, rate, um, and we will now open it up to the floor. In addition, you can submit comments or questions uh, not only to Nancy Seinflone, who's here, uh, but also um, online um, or through our, can we do it through the Facebook? No, they follow us on Facebook. You can, you can do it online or in writing. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we're now going to open up the floor, as the Commissioner said, to comments from the public. Uh, we ask that you keep your remarks to, uh, to no more than five minutes because we want to make sure that everyone who would like to speak has an opportunity to do so. And so I would first like to call up uh, Robin Warwick. Thank you, um, first off, I'd like to say, first off, I'd like to say, terrific presentation. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I was going to say I, I don't approve of the 3% that you guys have convinced me. That's good. Um, 
the, the, my main component was that for the last five years, it's always been an increase. Every year it's an increase, so my wage isn't going up, but every, my costs are going up. I have a funny accent. I'm from Australia, but I am American. My father was born in New York. I've been living here for 20 years, so pretty much New Yorker. What I'm here is that um, you guys spend at least $26 million on a really outdated form of this, what's really now become medication called fluoride. Um, I, I didn't make a PowerPoint presentation, um, but this is what we put in our water. Um, it's a toxin, and uh, this is do not take internally. Everyone's going to say, okay, it's diluted. The, 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 the level used to be four milligrams parts per million. It's now just, just recently down to 0.7. It should be zero because this toxin is doing a lot of damage. Um, it's also cr very corrosive. It's destroying the pipes, it leaches out metals. It's used in the steel industry, it's used in the uranium industry, it's used in lots of different in industries, and this is a waste product. It's not sodium fluoride, it's not the stuff that you find in your toothpaste. And the stuff in your toothpaste, it says, do not swallow, call the CDC if you do swallow. But we're putting this in our water, and we've been doing it for 60 years. Um, this is a, a, from the 2011 Water Board. Um, says the New York State Dental Association indicated that a continuous interruption of fluoridation is not expected to have significant impact on dental health. The reason why we put fluoride in the water is supposed to be to help our teeth. It doesn't when we drink it. We, it, it works topically. It attacks the bacteria in our mouth. When we drink it, it doesn't stay in our mouth. 50% gets passed out and it goes to different parts of our body. Um, but you say, but everybody's teeth decay has, has gone down, right? Well, that's true. But 97% of European countries, Western European countries, do not fluoridate. 3% do. This is a chart showing that it's a huge, it's a, sorry, here. <laughs> Excuse me, I need to, that's me. Um, the World Health Organization, this is data, and you probably can't see this, but is it in a big PowerPoint presentation? Um, Every single country has reduced their um, dental decay and they don't fluoridate the water. The four major countries, Australia, US, New Zealand, and Ireland, except Ireland has now said we don't want it either. There's only th left three countries. Yes, we have re reduced it. We also brush our teeth. We also use floss. We also use fluoridated toothpaste. We also have fluoride in our beer, our, our bread, our meat. We have fluoride everywhere because it's used to, f to water our plants uh, and, and feed animals. You know, to, okay. um, and this is proof that it doesn't, there's no correlation between water fluoridation and tooth decay. As you can see, this is, this is, these are all um, counties from New York and um, this is from the CDC website. Um, some of us are not to correlate this. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Can, every, can everybody see this? So, so the top line, the top line is in red is low social economic status, and the bottom line going up and down is high social economic status. And the line, the black line, I don't know if you can see that, that's water fluoridation. Here is zero, it goes up to 70%. There is no correlation between water fluoridation and tooth decay. This is third graders, sort of by fluoridation rate. There's no correlation. Okay, so there's no correlation between water fluoridation and dental decay going down. The Dental Association says it's safe and effective. It's not effective, and it's not safe. It really isn't. It's, um, there's a bunch of different studies out there. The latest one I found it's done, this one is actually done in the United States. Most of the studies done are in other countries. Most of the other studies are done are in other countries. They're not done in the United States. This study was actually done in the United States. Uh, can everyone see that, that there's, there's actually a correlation this time? There's like, there's three lines and they all go up. Down here is actually, um, I'm time, I'm time. Can I, can I have a little bit extra time? Is everyone okay with that? Sure, yeah, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is the, down the bottom is the, um, 
artificial water fluoridation prevalence, right? So it goes from zero to 100%. This line here, the bottom one in red, is 2003. This one is 2000 and, I can't read, 2007 and 2011. So these are all different time, all different years. The top line is attention deficit disorder in children. This is just a correlation study. It's not a randomized, randomized control study looking at blood levels of fluoride, because we kind of don't do that. If you go to your doctor and say, look, can I check my fluoride level because I've got problems elsewhere? They're like, I'm sorry, fluoride's great for you. It's good for your teeth. You know, the studies aren't well published yet. Um, so anyway, back to my chart, sorry. All, all of these are showing increases in ADHD. How they did this, they looked at an area that was fluoridated and looked at an area that wasn't fluoridated. No, they didn't. I'm sorry, that was another study. This is this study. Um, this study, so again, it's, just, it's a correlation study, but this means we need to do more studies. The, the EPA, the CDC, the FDA all say not enough studies, not the correct studies, not the properly controlled, randomized, um, randomized, randomized controlled studies have been done. So this is an un, it's not randomized, it's just a correlation study, but it means that we need to do more studies. This one is really scary. I'm not too sure again if you can see this, but you can see the, the, darker, the darker grids and then against the, the lighter colored ones. Now, I think most people in this room know what a bell curve is and look at the IQ. The IQ, the average IQ, is going to be in the center, right? Average IQ of people, you get a bunch of people and you look at the average IQ and it should be, the center should be in the middle, but the, the IQ of 90 to 109 should be in the center, right? This gray stuff is for non-fluoridated area. This one here, the highest level, that's the average IQ of an area that's been fluoridated. This study was done in Iran. It was controlled for social economics, um, you know, a whole bunch of different age, oh, well, sorry, the age is, uh, was IQ of children, I'm sorry, I don't remember that, the actual details. But it shows a big shift. We are having a huge problem. We're having a problem with, with um, thyroid. Fly fluoride used to be given as a, um, if you had hyperfluoride, uh, sorry, thyroid. If you had, if you had two, uh, active thyroid, they used to give you fluoride tablets in Europe to reduce your thyroid function. What's happening in America now? We've got a huge amount of people with thyroid problems, hypothyroidism. A study just recently has come out in the United Kingdom. Um, they looked at one area that was fluoridated, fluoridated and another area that was unfluoridated. And, and the UK only has 10%. 10% of the UK have... have um, Fluoridated. So they were able to separate the two. They called up every single GP, and if a GP is like a PCP, or a general, general practitioner, and they asked for every single patient, did they have, do they have hypothyroidism or are they okay? And they showed a correlation between water fluoridation going up, hypothyroidism went up. Can we get to leave those with us? Um, yes, I would love to. Or send them to us electronically? Yeah, if we can have them, we're happy to put them in the yeah. official record. Okay. Um, and did I give you everything? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank um, you very much. This cost me uh, $5 to. Do you want to send it to us electronically? <laughs> I'm not no. sure. I'm I'm not sure. We, well, we can figure out how to. Well, actually, if I can, if I can send it to you okay. electronically, that would be great. Okay. That's oh, fine. You can, yeah. 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 Right. You can yeah. email it okay. to uh, New York City and excuse me, NYC Water Board at DEP. That NYC. Or, Thank you, you, so or much you can send us the sources, and we'll. And like, well, I, I do have a, I do have a pamphlet that has about twelve different um, sources, like all the independent uh, research. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. I do have enough for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks again for the great. Um, at this point, uh, we'd like to open up the floor to anyone that has not signed up in advance, but would like to speak anyway. Uh, yes, sir, if you would, would mind coming down to, uh, to one of the microphones and uh, introducing yourself. I just had a question that uh, some of the folks who uh, are having trouble paying the bills and their houses are uh, being put in the paper for liens. Sorry. Um, could, could 
you identify yourself? I'm sorry. First name is Neil. Last name is Napolitan. Live in Garfield Place in Brooklyn. And the microphone, please. Sorry. Is that better? Tap for the record. Um, I just w would like to know if um, there are more things that we could do for these folks. Uh, years ago, they made a kit that had a shower head and different uh, aerators for the faucets and whatnot that help people reduce their usage, and they were very effective. And I got them for my home, and my neighbors got them. Um, because the paper, they're almost two thirds of all the liens were water. And that just came up in the daily news. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Just for your information, um, we do not sell liens on single family homes. Um, so there are other small buildings, but not on single family homes. But that's an excellent suggestion. We do have uh, a conservation program, but we've been focusing on working with uh, large multifamily buildings to try to get them to install low flow toilets and, um, and fixtures. But I think information about um, what, people, what people can do to reduce their use is a really good idea. And we'll look at some way we can get that out to people. Thank you. Yes, if you wouldn't mind coming down to one of the microphones. Good evening, the name's Deborah Smith. Um, first question, I've got several, hope I can do them within my five minute time limit. Um, is this a fait accompli, the rates get changed? Because the way it's um, presented here with the timetable is like, oh yes, we presented and then they're gonna vote on it. So I'm just curious. Tell me your name again. Deborah Smith. Ms. Smith, first of all, thank you for coming and, and thank you for asking the question. Uh, we are committed to listen to what people have to say about this proposed rate increase. Nobody who is going to vote on this has made up his or her mind about what the, what the final result will be. So the answer to your question is no, this is not a fatal complaint. Okay. Just as a follow-up to that, because the presentation was excellent, as the um, preceding, the first speaker said, you've almost convinced me that you need the money. Um, <laughs> what would come to bear for it not to become the rate increase that's, I mean, what what um, factors would uh, be relevant to change the amount from 3.24 to something else? A, a myriad of things, actually, uh, or I guess that's the incorrect use of myriad. Myriad things would, would be the result. Um, the, what has happened is that staff has projected its budget for next year. And, and that, those are the numbers that uh, that Commissioner Lloyd showed us at the, probably the last or third slide. There's a difference between the money we know we're going to need, uh, that staff knows it's going to need, uh, to undertake the projects that, that staff has planned for next year, and uh, the amount of money that staff now recognizes we are likely to have. And that difference could mean any number of things. It could mean, I assume, that certain projects are not going to be addressed. We're not going to be able to do the things that, that we would want to do, some of the things we want to do, in, in order to ensure that the operation uh, and that the quality of the water you receive is what staff wants it to be and, and what we are required to provide the public. So, so can I tell you precisely what would not occur? My answer to that is no, I, I don't know. Uh, but clearly, if there's a a multi-million dollar difference between what we know we need and what we're going to have, uh, then something has to has to actually be cut. And I don't know what that would be. Staff would have to make that decision. Okay. Um, this question goes more to the rate that's not changing, which is the minimum, um, which is what I usually pay. Um, I'm a single person living in a single family home. And most of my water usage is during the summer for the garden, where the water is not going into the sewage system. So my question is, how fair is it to charge 159% for sewage for water that never sees the system? Well, that's a very good question. Um, and we often get that question. 
question in Staten Island. We didn't last night uh, for the first time in several years. So the 159% the uh, is calculated if you, you saw on portions of Commissioner Lloyd's presentation that when you look at the system as a whole, about 40% of the total system costs are for water, about 60% are for wastewater, uh, wastewater treatment, the handling of storm water, and so on. Um, we measure the flow that goes through our wastewater treatment plants. It's an average of 1.2 billion gallons a day. That takes into account that some of the water that comes out of your tap or out of your garden hose gets absorbed. Some of it doesn't enter into the sewer, but all across the city, um, and, and we have to structure our rates according to the averages across the city, so um, it does take into account that some customers like you with gardens, not all of your water will go into the wastewater system. Other customers, a much higher percentage does. I think I, the one thing I would add is that um, if you have the ability to use a rain barrel, uh, you have one? I have several. Oh, good. <laughs> I would good. like more, right. but um, I, I don't have official rain barrels. That was actually on my list because I wanted to know what the DEP was doing to encourage the rain barrel program. I just put my own type of catchment um, devices all around my home. I'm trying to change from a uh, asphalt roof to a metal roof on my garage now so that I won't have the type of runoff in the water that I'm using in my garden from the asphalt and any potential uh, toxins there. Um, but yes, that was on my list. Um, <laughs> I, can see, I, can, I can address that. Eric's like. very eager to talk to you about so, that. Um, so uh, the agency works very closely with uh, elected officials all around the city to schedule rain barrel events in the spring and summertime. And uh, Ibrahim abdul Mott is in the back from the Bureau of Public Affairs and Janice Hubbard, also from the Bureau of Public Affairs. Uh, and they can speak to you directly about what events currently we have scheduled uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, and if we don't have one scheduled with your elected official yet, we encourage you to reach out to that elected and ask that they schedule one with us and we'll be happy to do so. Okay. And then just the minimum rate. Again, um, I've been told that it, uh, equivalently, it's equivalent to about 1,300 cubic feet per month. Um, on, I believe it says that on the bill. Um, whereas your, if your usage is markedly less than that, um, how is that fair in and of itself? So it, the cost of that is essentially the cost of delivering the infrastructure to your home. As you saw in the slides, about half of our cost is paying debt service on the water lines, the sewer lines, um, the wastewater treatment plants, the system that brings the water from upstate. So that really covers the cost of providing service to every building in New York City. And everyone shares equally in that cost. But whether, if I actually used or sold that water to Pepsi, <laughs> I'm still gonna be paying the same amount of money. And it, there's a disincentive to save water when you don't need it, don't need to use it, but you're going to be paying for it anyway. And when you go below that level of about 100 gallons a day, um, that's true, but we have to have everyone cover the cost of the infrastructure, uh, whether or not they use a lot of the water just for having that service. You have to have the service. It's a Department of Health regulation. It's a basic component of, of being in a building in New York City and having it be considered habitable and we just have to find a way to share the cost among everyone. So everyone pays about the equal amount for the infrastructure. I, I was too young to own a home when I believe the conversion was made, but there used to be a, a flat rate and you could opt into um, metered. Mm -hmm. And it just seems to me that I, I have a metered home now when I'm still paying a flat rate regardless. And mm -hmm. I think the, the metered amount, which tracks the greater use, uh, was meant to encourage people to conserve um, by having them pay for the amount that they use, but it's over and above that minimum charge. I, I understand your frustration. We haven't figured out a better way to cover the costs of the basic infrastructure throughout the city. Because if we didn't do that, then the costs 
would be assigned to other people to carry the cost of the infrastructure that's basically supporting your particular building. Um, and I think that people who use less than 100 as they get their water down are frustrated by it. We just haven't found a better solution to cover those very big costs of, of the infrastructure. Yes, because at this level, it seems like we're subsidizing the others who are using and the water. I'm not using water that I'm paying for, and that's there's something inherently wrong there. Um, the last question, which um, I only thought of when I saw all of your wonderful slides on the dams and, and um, tunnels, is does any part of this budget go toward anti-terror? Oh, yes. Um, we have, and I can't give you an exact number, but we could certainly send it to you. Um, we have a police force, actually, that is focused entirely on protecting the water system. Um, they work very closely. The Deputy Commissioner for Police and Security is a former NYPD person. Uh, we have uh, someone assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Um, we work very closely with NYPD and with the New York State Police. Uh, we monitor all of the information about terrorism. And we have, over time, uh, really identified where we think the vulnerabilities of the system are, which, of course, we don't talk about. Um, but we watch those very, very closely. So, yes. Thank you. Last, if I may, um, you spoke of the sidewalks swales? Bioswales, bio yes. Bioswales, which I, I, I think is an excellent idea. Um, I had visited other uh, Caribbean countries where you actually have catchment tanks under your home. Um, and when I did my research, it seemed that those were not allowed in New York City. Is that still the case, and will that always be the case? I don't know exact. I'm not sure exactly what that is. What that? What you mean by that? If, but if you could stay and we could discuss it afterwards, let us Certainly. try to get more information and, and continue the conversation with you. Thank you so much. Terrific Thank questions. You. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the audience that would like to would like to speak? Seeing none. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize in the back. Good evening and good evening audience. My name is Josefina Sanfeliu and regarding the anti-terrorism question, I've heard on the news that fishing is going to be allowed in the Central Park Reservoir. Is that true and is that seriously smart? And there's a fence around the whole thing. How is that going to happen? Thank you. I don't know exactly what the answer to that is, but that the reservoir is not an active reservoir anymore. Um, it's not drinking water. Uh, we sometimes use it when we discharge water uh, from the system to balance it, but it is not drinking water, so we don't protect it in the same way we do um, the other reservoirs. But thank you, it's an excellent question. We worry, we worry about um, that a great deal. We don't allow it at our in-city reservoirs, Jerome, Park Reservoir is one, and uh, Hillview and Yonkers is another one where we don't allow fishing. This work before I, before I call on you. Is, is there anyone else that has not yet spoken? I would like to. Um, this work briefly, if you, if you yeah. like. Um, you had a fantastic slide in the beginning about all the different uh, toxic areas, like the, um, so I remember first coming to the Hudson, it was just this, Horrible, the, well, scared. The places that have gotten Yeah, I mean, this is a fantastic slide. Yeah, that makes one. Yeah, that one. Um, question like, are we footing the bill to claim this? Yes. So why, I mean, where did the toxins come from in the first place? Well, they're not all toxins. The biggest, the biggest in terms of something being, a, a water body being swimmable, the biggest impediment is fecal coliform. So they come from combined sewer overflows, uh, which is why so much of what we're mandated to do is to control those. Um, when, there's a, when there's a rainstorm that puts in, in the combined sewer system, uh, typically the sewer system is about 10% used by sanitary sewage from buildings. And then it has the capacity for 90% more, which is rainwater, which comes in off the street, or sometimes off of people's properties if it's connected in. 
when the amount coming through the sewer system is more than the wastewater treatment plant can handle, one of two things happen. If there is a tank built there to hold combined sewer overflows, it will go into the tank, which will hold it until the plant has capacity again, and then it gets pumped through the plant. But if there is not a tank, then it goes into the surrounding water. So that's water, which is called a combined sewer overflow. It's about 10% sanitary sewage. So of course it has fecal coliform in it. And that is what creates a problem. It also gets into the water very significantly. Uh, and we're just starting to look at actually what the different sources are. The other source is animal waste in the city. Uh, so the birds, dogs, all the other animals, coyotes apparently now, um, all, the other, seven of them. all the other <laughs> animals in the city, the, you know, the million raccoons in, in Prospect Park, it always seems to me, um, all of that ends up in the water system as well. And that's what makes it unswimmable. So what, 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 by and what, large, this is, this is all about cleaning that up. And we're very far down that road, as you can see, but it's been very costly. I, I, when I first came here, I thought there were like things like PCBs and a whole bunch of... There are in the tributaries, by and large, and in the Hudson River, but those are being cleaned up under different programs where the polluters, by and large, are held responsible. This for example, morning, the Gowanus yeah. Canal, yeah. we're responsible yeah. for cleaning up the CSOs, including the deposits uh, in the Gowanus Canal. But the uh, companies uh, whose predecessor companies were responsible for the industrial waste are responsible for their share. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jim Rogers. Sir, would you like, would you mind coming down so we have it in the record? No problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Jim Rogers. Just one fast question. You said you have an in-house that came up with that budget. Is that those numbers uh, verified from an outside source? The short answer is yes, and and like every other city agency, DEP um, proposes a budget. It gets reviewed by the city's central office of management and budget, um, and ultimately gets reviewed uh, by the mayor and, and approved by the mayor, um, and and then that budget. Um, sometime next week will be certified by the city's budget director and one of the considerations the water board members will make when they adopt a rate next week is that certification from the city budget director that this is the amount of money that DEP needs to operate and maintain the water system. Thank you. Thank you. But I, I think we should add to that that um, every capital project that we do, uh, the contract has to be reviewed and uh, registered by the city's controller, which is the, the sort of other part of the government that oversees the city's finances. So you do get funds from the general fund? No, we get no, no funds from the general all. fund. No. no. Well, not for any of the water system. We have also responsibilities. Uh, to monitor asbestos and air quality, and that's funded from the general fund, but that's often totally separate on the side. And, and our books are um, audited every year by an independent auditor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think I think the one that's most visible is Coney Island Creek, but I'm not entirely sure. I think the Gowanus Canal is um, significantly more north. Um, I don't know if you saw the articles a few days ago about on Earth Day, the guy going swimming and everyone being so concerned, but the thing, and then another advocate went and tested the water. The thing that's so interesting to us is that the things that we've already done. We've opened a flushing tunnel which brings fresh water in from the East River. We've put screens, we've uh, put an additional pumping capacity to take more CSOs um, to the Red Hook plant. In terms of fecal coliform, the Gowanus is now swimmable. 
um, the contamination that's there uh, is the industrial contamination. And there's a, uh, a meeting on May 14th uh, about the Gowanus Canal and specifically the agency's long-term control plan to reduce combined sewer overflows. And again, Ibrahim and Denise in the back can give you more information about that meeting. Well, excuse me, where's the location of the Red Hook plant? Uh, the location of the? Red Hook plant. The location of the Red Hook plant. Oh, it's in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, any other additional comments? Great. Uh, before we conclude this hearing, I would like to remind you that the written remarks can be submitted uh, to the New York City Water Board by mail. Uh, again, that address is 5917 Junction Boulevard, uh, the 8th floor in Flushing, New York, 11373. Again, you can also email nycwaterboard at dep.nyc.gov. And as a reminder, please submit any of those comments no later than 5 p.m. Friday, May 1st. Uh, again, again, Nancy, our Deputy Commissioner for the Bureau of Customer Services in the back, if you have specific questions about your account, uh, and Ibrahim and Denise from the Bureau of Public Affairs. Mr. Chairman, if there's no further business. There's no further business. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming.